I'm sure many of you have had this experience before. How many of you have, have turned to your Bibles maybe in the morning or at noon whenever maybe you normally read the Scriptures daily? You've turned to the Bible before and you're reading and it just seems like God is really speaking to you at that moment. Many of you, no doubt, have had that experience before. Uh, maybe you've read that passage several times in the past, but this time when you come to this passage, it's as if heaven comes down, your eyes are open, you see things you've never seen before, and as if God is speaking directly to you. And how many of us, unfortunately, have had this experience before? We go to the Bible, we open it up, everything as far as we know is right in our life. We're reading the Bible, and it seems as if the Bible is a dead book. And it seems like it's dry. And it seems like at that moment we'd rather go do housework, we'd rather go cut the grass, we'd rather go do some chore that we never liked doing. We would rather do anything at that time except read the Bible. And I would say some of us at least have experienced that in our lives before. And when we think about these experiences, the experiences of God speaking, the experience that it seems like He's not speaking, we acknowledge the Bible's God's Word, isn't it? And being the, the Word of God, by default, it always speaks to us. This is always God speaking. And yet we know from experience there's times when it really seems like God is speaking and times like it really seems like He's not. He's cut us off for a time in our lives for some reason. Well, what I want us to see in Ephesians 1 is one reason why this is sometimes. One reason why sometimes as Christians we feel that way in our lives. Whether we're very blessed or whether sometimes we're, we just seem as if God's not speaking to me for some reason. I want us to see why that is. One reason why that is. I want us to look in verse 18. And I think this is going to be a very beneficial message for Christians today. And for anybody else, I hope, but especially Christians to help us on our journey today. We're going to read verse 18 and then part of verse 19 together. Listen as I read verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart or understanding, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe? I want to ask three questions this morning from this first part of verse 18. Three questions. And I think these three questions are very much going to help us today as Christians. This is the first question I want to ask, and this is such an important one. Who is He praying for here in verse 18? Who is He praying for? That's right, He is. I want you to notice the first part of verse 18. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It says, I pray that. That's in italics. That's added. That's not in the Greek. But the reason that's there by the translators is to give us the sense. If you look back in verse 16, Do not, sit, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 18 is a continuation of this prayer that Paul is speaking of here. He's praying for the people. He's praying. And this is, this is amazing. Let's start back in verse 15 and just see what he's praying for. He's not praying for the lost here. This is a key for us as Christians today. The lost need this too. But this Apostle Paul is praying for us who are Christians and for his people at Ephesus. Verse 15, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. So look at how the Ephesian Christians are described. He says he's heard of their faith. These are people who are believers. He says in verse 15, your love for all the saints. These aren't believers who are backslidden. These are believers who know the Lord. They have great love for the saints. Verse 16, Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And what's part of his prayers here? Verse 17, 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom. Now, as Christians, do we have wisdom? We do. And yet Paul's praying for a spirit of wisdom to be given to the Ephesian Christians. And of revelation in the knowledge of Him. As Christians, do we know God? Every Christian knows God, and yet here Paul says, you need a revelation of who He is. You need to see more fully, we may say, about who God is. Again, this is Christian people he's speaking of. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. We'll look more at that in a moment. So that you will know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe? Why, why, why are there so many Christians downcast today? Why are there so many Christians living so far below where God wants them? One reason is this. They do not know that they need to pray for themselves. That even as Christians, they may come to know God in a far deeper way. And may see the realities of God's Word. Just look in chapter 3, you'll see another example of this. Again, Paul is praying for Christians here. He's praying for believers. Again, they're not backslidden believers. They're not living in sin. He says nothing about that. These are people who know God. They know Jesus Christ. They have the Holy Spirit. And look what it says in chapter 3, starting in verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that He would grant you, this is a prayer, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. And then look what it says in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I'll pause there. Again, as Christians, does Christ dwell in our hearts by faith? He does. And yet Paul says, oh, He can dwell in such, we may say, a higher way than He is right now. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. What's he talking about? Verse 19, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. This is believers. Now don't raise your hand, but you who are Christians today, how many of us know that God loves us? We know that, don't we? And yet, our knowledge can become far greater, but look what it says. It's talking about in verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. He's praying for, not only do we know up here that God loves us and Christ loves us, but this is an experimental knowledge. This is knowing it through experience that He loves us. How many of us can remember when we were born again, when we were saved? How many of us can remember the times, maybe as a young Christian, diligently seeking the Lord? And and hopefully as an older Christian, but seeking God and then just having the Spirit of God come to you in a new way. And having just your heart, it seems like, exploding with joy and gratitude and love and excitement and peace and everything else. That's knowing something of the love of God. And what Paul is praying for is for Christians to experience these things anew and afresh. This has helped me. I need to pray for this as a pastor for you all. You all need to pray for one another to come to know in a deeper way and to experience the love of Christ. To know God in a far deeper way. So who is Paul writing to back in chapter 1? He's writing to Christian people that Christ may dwell in our hearts in a far greater way than we know right now, that we may have the eyes of our heart opened. He's praying for Christians here, for us today. Here's a second question I want to ask about verse 18 in chapter 1. What does this show about us, brothers and sisters? 
what does this show about us? You know, one thing that shows us plainly isn't this, that we are completely dependent on God. We're completely dependent on Him. From the moment we are born and we begin to grow up, from the moment we are converted and saved to the moment we die, we are dependent upon Him. In the garden, what does God do? He breathes the breath of life into Adam. What does God do to the disciples? What does Jesus do to the disciples in the book of John? He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. What does He do to everyone who's born again? He gives them the Holy Spirit. And then when death comes, what happens? He takes the Spirit of life out of them. And now, if they're Christians, they're with the Lord forever. From, be- from the beginning to the middle to the end, our whole lives are about God. And like I've said before, one of the reasons that sometimes we as Christians struggle is God God brings us under conviction. Maybe we're in a church service or maybe we're in our living room and conviction comes upon us and the Holy Spirit's dealing with us and we know we need God and we cry out and believe His promises and God saves us and what happens after that? Well, the work's done. I'm saved. And if we're not careful... As Christians, we will go through the Christian life thinking, I don't need God as much as I did the night I got saved. And that is not what Paul is saying here. What Paul is saying to us is, we need Christ today as much as we needed Him when we were saved and as much as we'll ever need Him. We need Him today just as bad, Christian. We need Him. Just turn to Judges two, Judges chapter 7 or listen as I read. Let me give you an example of the pride sometimes that's in our hearts, unfortunately. We don't want it there. We need to repent of it if it's there. But the fact is, if we're not careful, we're going to think that, that we, you know what, we've had some victories in the Christian life and we may not need God as much as we used to. And what we're seeing today, as you're turning there, and I, as I'm getting ready to read, what we're seeing today in the churches in this country is this, Once you pull back all the games and once you pull back all the things that have nothing to do with Christianity, you begin to see how much power you really have. And the need for God is just as much now as ever. Just as much now. So in Judges chapter 7, what's happened? You've got Israel and they're going to go to battle. And it's such a revealing and helpful verse in so many ways, but especially today in what we're looking at. They're getting ready to go to the battle, and you know what God says? God says, no, you've got too many people. How many human generals would say, no, we've got too many people. We need to back off some from this. Do you remember in the book of Joshua, they did that once? And what happened there? They thought they had arrived. There was sin, though, in the camp. At another time, I believe, in the book of Joshua too. Look what it says in verse 2, chapter 7 of Judges. The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. Now what's going to happen here? They have 32,000 people. They're going to go down to 10,000 people. They're going to finally go down to 300 people to fight and war with. Why is God doing this? The Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. Why? Listen to what he says. For Israel would become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. If Israel went to war with all the people they had, they would have said, you know what? We really didn't need God here. We did it ourselves. But God says, no, no, no. You're going to get down to such a number that if you get victory, you know it comes from me. And if we're not careful in our Christian life, we're going to think, you know what? I've had some success. I've seen some things happen. Man, I've done pretty well. And that's when sometimes God humbles us, isn't He? God pulls the rug out from under us, not because He hates us, but because He loves us. To let us know, no, no, no. Every victory you've ever had is from me. Every victory you've had from me. Now look with me in a few places about the need for for our eyes to be opened. Look in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We read there earlier. Psalm 119, we're going to read verse 18. This 
is one of the great places in the Bible that speak of the Word of God. We read the first 16 verses earlier today. One of the great, this is probably the great psalm, if you want to say it this way, about the Word of God. All these verses really are looking at how wonderful God's Word is. And yet, look what the psalmist prays in verse 18. The psalmist says, Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. He says, Lord, please open my... The Word of God has not changed, you see. The Word of God is right there in front of Him. It's the same that it's always been. If you remember in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. When our eyes are enlightened, our spiritual eyes are enlightened. It's not putting something in front of us that wasn't there already. No, it's already been there. What the enlightenment of our eyes, our spiritual eyes, means is this. God is allowing us to see what's always been there. And here is the psalmist, this great psalm about the Word of God. And what does he pray? He prays, God, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in Your law. Is the Word of God wonderful? If if every person in America confessed to be an atheist and they all said there's not one wonderful thing in the Bible, all of them would be liars and all the wonderful things would still be here. Amen? Just because we can't see them doesn't mean it's not there. Friends, it's there, but we need eyes to see them. And the psalmist is praying for that. Look in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> This is after the resurrection, and uh, Christ is walking. He has disguised who He is, and He's talking to some people here at the very beginning. And part of what they say to Him, they don't know who He is yet, in verse 21 it says, "...but we were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel." Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. What are these disciples talking about? These disciples, as has been pointed out by another, these disciples are acting like much of the modern church today. The resurrection has happened, and they're still going around like it's, they're sad. And they're down. And what they need is eyes to see reality. And look what it says in verse 31 and 32. This is after Jesus is there. He's speaking to them. He rebukes them in verse 25 and 26. It says in verse 31 and 32, Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized Him, and He vanished from their sight. Look what verse 32 says. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while He was speaking to us on the road, while He was explaining the Scriptures to us? That's the test of real preaching. Does the heart of the listener burn when the Word of God is opened up? And then look in verse 44 and 45. This is later. Now He said to them, These are My words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about Me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Verse 45 now. And He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. The same thing must happen to us Beloved, as we read the Bible, as we listen to a sermon, our mind, our spiritual mind, our hearts must be open to see what the Word of God is saying. One more place, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now this is speaking to a church that's backslidden. They, they've, they've gone away from where they need to be, but still you'll see the principle here. <clears throat> Starting in verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Now listen to the last part of this verse. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now this is a backslidden church. And still, for us even who are not backslidden, we're walking with God, this is still true. We need spiritual eye ointment upon our spiritual eyes that we may see the greatness of God's Word before us. One preacher talked about a story. Any of you ever heard of William Wilberforce before? Uh, William Wilberforce, a Christian politician that was a key player in abolishing slavery in Great Britain a number of years ago. Well, he, were, he was friends with a man named William Pitt the Younger, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And William Wilberforce, being the Christian he was, he got the Prime Minister to come with him to hear this preacher preach. And while they were listening to pre this preacher preach, William Force was just, he was so happy because he was listening and the preacher was really preaching well that day and God was working. And William Wilberforce, as the Christian, his heart was just lifted up to heaven. He was listening to this preacher preach. He's enraptured. And at the end of the service, the prime minister says something like this to him. He says, you know what? I was really concentrating today, but I just couldn't figure out what he was talking about in the whole sermon. And that was a Christian and unbeliever. But what we have today, the principle remains. So many times we're hearing the sermon, we're reading the Bible on our own. It's like our eyes are closed. We need to come to God and say, Oh Lord, open my eyes up. I need to pray what Paul has prayed for me. Father, give me eyes to see the glory of God in the Scriptures. And this is the last question I would ask us today about Ephesians chapter 1. What does this mean for us today as Christian people? What does this mean for us? He's, pre he's praying for Christians. It shows us that we are dependent upon God. But what does this mean for us today as Christians? And I think what it means for us is very, very helpful Let me ask you a question. What did you do last night? And what did you do this morning? This is what I mean. I'll use an example of young people. Young people, and I'm not talking about bad things, I'm just talking about good, wholesome fun. But young people sometimes, they uh, Saturday, Saturday comes, so that's the time to spend time with their friends, nothing wrong with that. They're having a good, wholesome time, and they may stay up way into the night. What happens? Maybe they're playing basketball. They play basketball into the wee hours of the morning. They are wore out. They take a shower, go to bed. The alarm clock goes off. They hit snooze. What? They look at the alarm clock. It's almost time for church. They get up. They dress. They're on the road. They sit in the back of the pew with their eyes half asleep. And they may think to themselves, you know what, at least I made it today. If what we're looking at is true, and it is true, we need to prepare our hearts for worship, don't we? If this is true, what happens on a Saturday night and what happens on a Sunday morning is very important to my spiritual health. Am I awake physically, but am I awake spiritually? Have I been like a young person out playing basketball? Again, there's nothing wrong with basketball. I wish I could play more today, honestly, to be honest with you. I wish I could. But I'm sure there's times that I've done that in my life. I've wasted time when I didn't have to, and I get up, I haven't prayed, I haven't read the Bible, I come to church service just ready to be fed, but I get nothing. Why? Because my heart's not in it. I'm not, re I'm not ready to receive a blessing from the Lord. Now, we all know things happen. When things happen, well, things happen. But what I'm talking about is just completely wasting time, completely forgetting about the responsibility I have for my soul. What do we do? 
Do we prepare ourselves for worship today? Have we prepared ourselves? What about this? What do we do when we read the Bible? When we open our Bibles up, though we don't want to be legalistic and though we don't want to say the same words as if they're magic every time, the same magic prayer when we open up the Bible, and yet in our heart, do we know, hey, if, I, if God doesn't help me with this, I'm getting nothing out of it. If God doesn't open my eyes today, I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian for decades, but if God doesn't open my eyes today, I will be a beggar and I will be poor today because I will get nothing from the Scripture itself. That ought to be our attitude. We may not say that every time. But our attitude is this, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. I think you've found this out as Christians before. How many times has your heart been cold and there's not one thing you can do about it? You ever been there before? It may be that we've sinned and we need to repent, but, but it may just simply be this. God has withdrawn Himself for a time from us to let us know how strong we really are on our own. And we come to the Bible and the Bible is cold, it's dry, it's like it's dead. There's nothing going on. And at that time, we finally see our need and we say, Oh God, I need Your help. I need to hear from You today. Lord, where are You? And God drops manna down from heaven, doesn't He? Have you ever revived yourself before? I sure have never revived my own heart before. It's God who does these things. We need Him to open our eyes. Have you ever got down to pray? And you need to pray before you pray. And what I mean is this, you get down to pray and you say, Lord, my heart feels cold. You feel distant. I confess that to you. God, help me pray now. You pray before you pray. You're listening to a sermon. You're listening to the preacher. Have you prayed that God would open up your eyes, that the Word may come in and benefit you and help you? The Bible says that according to how we listen, that is how God will bless us. We need help from God to hear His Word, regardless of who's preaching. Do we pray for one another like this? Do we pray for brother or sister so-and-so? God, help them. Bless them in Your Word. Open their eyes out. Help our pastor, Lord. Bless him now. Help Your Holy Spirit minister to him. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and you're, you're saying the right things and yet it's like his heart is about that soft? You ever witnessed anybody like that? No, the reality is sometimes you may be doing just what God wants you to and God is with you and they just have a hard heart and they just resist you. But we know for a fact, don't we? That there's times when we witness and we know that God is with us. We know it. I remember witnessing to somebody on a mission trip in New York years ago. And, and the Lord, to His glory, was with me. And I was witnessing this man I never met before. Talking to him about the things of the Gospel. And he just got up and he left after a while. And I believe it's not because of me, but because God was so there. And He was working in His heart and it was too much. It was too much for him. He had to go. There's a difference between having the Lord with us. Now listen, if we're Christians, God is always with us. But there's a difference, just like we've been looking at today. There's a difference between, yes, having Christ dwell in our heart, and yet having Him dwell in our heart. There's a big difference there. Big difference. And, and, and really, to some degree, this sermon will be a success if simply we just see our need today. If we just simply recognize, maybe like we've never recognized before, that we have a spiritual need and we need God every hour, every day. I need Him as a Christian when I pray. I need Him when I read the Bible. I need Him when I preach. I need Him when I listen to preaching. I need Him all the time. If we will just simply have that recognition in our heart that I'm a, I'm, I'm a beggar, even as a Christian, I need Him. Then I will feel like today's a success. Because we need to know that, brothers and sisters. We need Him. We need Him. I want to end in, in just maybe one verse from Matthew 11, Matthew 13 rather. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 
verse 44. And what I'm talking about today is a test for Christians, but it's a test for Christianity. It's a test for Christianity, what I'm looking at today. Because how many people do we know who say, yes, I'm a Christian? And they go through the motions. And they serve a dead Savior. That's, how, that's the way their life looks. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Well, the test of Christianity really is, has my spiritual eyes been opened to reality? To reality. Verse 44 is a parable of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden. How is the kingdom of heaven described? It's a treasure. It's a treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. Here's a man in the field. He finds his treasure and he says, well, this is, I've never seen anything like this. And he puts it back in there and covers it up. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You see, one of the dangers, there's dangers all everywhere. One of the dangers is like for me, I believe extremely strong about holiness. Amen? I believe in repentance. Repentance. I believe you're not going to heaven unless you live like a Christian. Because the Bible says all that. The danger for me, and obviously that's good and right and true, but the danger that I could falsely fall into is this, always saying hard things like that. Those things are true, but this is true too. There's joy in the Christian life. Amen? There's a treasure to be found in the Christian life. And one of the tests of our Christianity is this, have we seen Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God as a treasure? Out of joy over who He is and His kingdom, out of joy over Christianity, have I gladly given up everything to follow after Him? That's the test. What does that mean? That means my eyes have been opened. I'm not just trying to, to stop doing the things I love so I can get to heaven. You know, I wish I could do some of these things, but I became a Christian, therefore I can't do the things I like anymore. i got to do the things I hate. i got to read the Bible and pray and talk about God. I don't like those things, but I want to get to heaven one day. So I'm going to work and try as hard as I can. The Bible's view of Christianity is this. The eyes of our heart has been opened. Christianity... Yes, there's hardship, but it's a treasure. There's hard things in Christianity. But just like Jesus Christ, the Bible says, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. What was that joy? The joy, the cross was not a joyous thing, a joyful thing. It was the wrath of God being poured out on the Son. And yet for joy He endured the cross. The joy of coming back into fellowship with God. The joy of not having the wrath of God on Him. And the joy of, re of, of redeeming a multitude of people. He said, there's so much joy over here, I'll endure the cross. And that's how our Christian life is. There's heartache, there's suffering in the Christian life. But for the joy set before me, I get to be with Jesus forever. I get to know Him. I get to love Him. I get to be in the kingdom of God forever. For the joy out there, I'm going to endure the sufferings of this life. And that is exactly, exactly what the false convert does not do. Mark 4. I shouldn't have said Matthew 13 is going to be the last Scripture. Mark chapter 4 speaks of the false convert. And briefly, I want you to see how he is described. Mark chapter 4, verse 16, 17. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they hear the Word, immediately receive it with joy. They're so happy about it. And they have no firm root or no root in themselves, but are only temporary. 
Then when an affliction or persecution arises because of the Word, immediately they fall away. One thing that we see there is this. The joy of their life was not Jesus Christ. The joy of their life was not the kingdom of God. Because when bad things happen to Christians, yes, they're bad things, we don't want to go through them, and yet for the joy set before us, we endure. Because we're not in the Christian life to feel good. That's a benefit. We are in the Christian life because we want the Lord, we want to be with Him, we want to know Him, we want to honor Him. Therefore, we endure all the hardships of life for Him. The test of Christianity is this. Have we seen Jesus as our treasure and as our joy? And I pray that all of us have. And if that's true, praise the Lord for us today. May God bless us. May God bless His Word. And may we know that we have a need, a need before Him.